Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera where today I'm going to be doing a video which is probably uh, going to be pretty useful for some of you out there, uh, those of you who have one of these old Ricoflex Dia cameras or some of you who have uh, bought these cameras from me or will buy one from me and uh, kind of have uh, a few questions about how it is used and how it works. Uh, and I'll be answering those in this video. Uh, the reason this video is important is because this camera operates a little bit differently than uh, other twin lens reflex cameras. And if you're familiar with uh, cameras like the, you know, the, the Ashikas or Minoltas or Roliflexes or things like that, if you get a hold of one of these Ricoflex uh, uh, dias, you're probably going to be scratching your head a little bit uh, trying to figure out a few things. And those things I'll discuss in this video. Uh, before I go on any further, I have another uh, public service announcement to make. Uh, at the end of next week, I'm going to be uh, going to America for uh, a trip for uh, a little more than a week. Uh, I have some uh, family things which I have to take care of out there, and uh, I'll be flying into Los Angeles and driving into the southwest to uh, uh, meet with relatives and family and things like that. Uh, and it's going to be, I don't know, uh, it kind of reminds me of that old movie, uh, Vanishing Point, where Kowalski uh, is uh, transporting that 1970 Dodge Challenger uh, RT uh, across the country. In my case, I've rented a Challenger, uh, of course not an RT, but um, and hopefully I won't have the, the same ending that Kowalski had in his movie. But I'm looking forward to uh, seeing a little bit of the uh, American Southwest again during this trip. And so, uh, of I'll leave my stores open uh, while I am gone, but uh, I keep in mind that I won't be able to ship anything until I return. So anyway, let's go ahead and uh, continue with the video here. <clears throat> and uh, this camera is the, the Ricoflex Dia M version. There were several versions of the, uh, the Dia model, and this is one of the earlier ones. You can kind of spot it because it has this kind of cutout here for uh, the flash sync socket. Some of the other variations don't have it. Uh, some of the variations have a, a shutter charging lever here. This particular one doesn't. Uh, some of them are silver around the dial. Some of them are black. So uh, as far as I know, there are about um, four different variations of the early Ricoh Dia. And uh, this one here is quite an amazing condition. I got this one in the original box. And as you can see, it looks like it's hardly been used. Uh, everything on this camera is quite nice. So I thought this would be a great example uh, to, to show you and give you an idea uh, how... Uh, and these cameras work. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with the front of the camera here and uh, what makes this camera different than some of the other Ricoflex cameras and uh, and I guess uh, twin lens reflex cameras of other makes is the style of the lenses which are just simple lenses with these uh, round uh, housings on them and these are kind of different from the later ones which use a, a bayonet system for mounting lens caps and hoods and filters and things like that. Uh, you can use filters on this by simply just using the, the slip-on style filters. They're also threaded and so they do make a smaller thread-in filter if you want to find those. And they have this kind of slide-on uh, lens cap. And the diameter of these uh, lenses is the same as the earlier Ricoflex, the ones with kind of the uh, mechanical geared focusing. So uh, the lens caps interchange on the different cameras. And this one is similar in that it uses the, the same charging system for the ch shutter that many of the earlier uh, Ricoflex cameras have. What I mean by that is we have a combined uh, shutter charging and shutter release lever on the bottom. Uh, to charge the shutter, you pull it one way and to fire it, you simply push it the other way. Uh, quite simple and in the earlier ones of course they located it a little bit more to this side but uh, uh, this is a quite simple uh, uh, system to use and also <clears throat> uh, it, uh, it some people said back then that it kind of reduces the possibility of vibration because you're moving it to the side instead of pushing back on it Honestly, I don't think it really makes that much of a difference, but um, uh, it, it's an interesting feature. And something that uh, some people who have bought these cameras from me have a, a question about. They've bought the camera and they're, they're not sure how to get the shutter to charge or how to fire it. And the simple thing is just pull it this way to the right, let go, and then push it to the left in order to fire the shutter. I mentioned earlier that there's a cutout here for the flash sync socket. And if you're using a flash, you can attach it here. And uh, this camera here has a cold flash shoe on it here, uh, on it here, obviously it's here, uh, on it. And so uh, compared to other Ricoflex cameras, this was an option. The earlier ones, uh, some of them had a shoe, some of them did not. Some of them had a hot shoe, some of them did not. So uh, Ricoh was kind of 
I don't know, a little strange when they were producing their uh, TLR cameras because uh, several cameras you might get, you know, two or three examples of the exact same model but find that they have different features. You might get the Ricoh Flex 7 and find that it has a, a flash socket or that it doesn't have a flash socket, uh, that it has a 100 speed, 200 speed, or 500 speed shutter, or um, that it has a uh, the, the old style cocking system or the more modern style, or in some cases they even have this uh, later style uh, a film winding and uh, film counting mechanism. So Ricoh is kind of an odd thing, and, and for that reason, uh, here in Japan anyway, they're quite collectible. Now, there are a lot of people who go out and try to collect all the various uh, models of the early Ricoh Flex cameras, and uh, it's kind of interesting uh, to, to collect these because they're not especially expensive, they're not especially uh, hard to find, but there are a couple models like the, the Ricoh Flex 7T, which are quite hard to find. I've only seen one of those, and that's kind of like the, the holy grail for the old uh, Ricoh Flex collectors. Uh, the ones like this one here, this this version is more common without as much variation on it, and is mainly a, a more solid and more user-friendly camera than some of the earlier ones, uh, though a little bit more complicated to use. We'll go ahead and start at the top here when I'm describing the camera and popping open the the focusing hood here. Uh, this camera is one of the first Ricos which had a, uh, a Fresnel glass added underneath the focusing screen. And this makes the image brighter when you are uh, trying to focus. And this is quite a handy thing to have if you're shooting where it's not very bright outside or when the sun is you know, going down or you're in the shade or whatever. Uh, this, the Fresnel of this kind of amplifies the light a little bit, or at least that's what it's advertised to do. And this is one of the, the more, I guess, the uh, improvements or which uh, Ricoh had marketed to help sell these cameras. Interesting thing about these is that you can adapt them to the earlier uh, Ricoh Flex cameras or other Ricoh Flex cameras or even of different makes because they're, they're basically the same. Uh, adding the Fresnel uh, uh, plastic lens underneath the focusing screen can uh, brighten up the uh, focusing screen and make it easier to focus. I uh, like the other cameras, all of them, they have a, a focusing loop and also are a sports finder which is uh, supposed to lock down like so all right there it goes and uh you know it works the same way as i've described on some of the other rico and yashica flex cameras <clears throat> uh, we have the focusing tabs here on the side and the this is different than other cameras which usually have a focusing knob on the side, but I actually like the way that Ricoh did this because it uses a helicoid gear in the center, a rather large one, rather than the uh, eccentric cam gears on the sides which you have in the uh, cameras with uh, uh, focusing knobs. And this is a much more reliable and precise system. I have a big issue with the focusing knobs on some cameras. Uh, sometimes the cams come loose or people drop the camera and damage the front uh, standard or hit it hard enough that it disrupts the cams and you get play in the front and it makes the camera hard to focus. Uh, these Ricoh Flex cameras uh, eliminate that uh, problem and it makes the camera much more reliable. Moving on to this side here, I already pointed out the flash shoe. Here we have the uh, pins which you use to hold in the film and the, the take up spool and uh, more toward the end of the video I'll show you how to load film in this camera and that's quite a, a critical part so make sure to stay tuned for that. On this side here we have this uh, mechanical film winding system and this is similar to the system which was used on early cameras like the Pearl 3. A very simple mechanical counting system which is self-contained and this winding system is held on with three screws on the inside and Ricoh uh, designed this so it could be sold as an, uh, an upgrade to their earlier Ricoh Flex cameras which is sim simply had a winding knob and a window on the back. By buying the uh, this winding, I guess, assembly here. You could put it in and that made the camera easier to load, uh, easier to use, especially if uh, you know it's dark or uh, you, you can't see the numbers moving up in the uh, film window see so easily. A very good idea. And also uh, the ones which uh, were manufactured by Ricoh are quite reliable. Uh, some of these, especially the ones in the old, I guess, uh, Konica Pearl cameras, the Pearl 3, uh, these often had issues with reliability and when the counter didn't work, you couldn't really uh, operate the camera that well unless you could adapt an earlier film back off of a, a Konica 2 or something like that and use the film counting windows. And for those of you who have issues with the Konica 3, that's what I would suggest to, you know, see if you could uh, find a broken Konica 2 and just swap the film doors and that way you can uh, use your Konica 3. On the back here, very plain and simple, as we have a mechanical film counter, there's no need for a film counter window. 
On the bottom of the camera, we have a standard quarter inch tripod socket and we have the latch which you use to open the film door. Now what I'm going to do next, uh, I'm going to demonstrate how to load the film. That's quite important on these cameras and that's what I have uh, the most questions about when uh, people buy them. Uh, the first thing you have to keep in mind is this mechanical film uh, uh, winder here. It has three parts. It has the winding knob, it has a, uh, a stop knob, and it has a reset knob. The stop knob here on the side or the stop lever, you depress when you've wound to the next frame and it won't turn anymore. You go ahead and take your photograph and you want to wind to the next frame. You have to push this up and that will allow you to wind to the next frame and that the knob will automatically lock with the frame properly aligned. You can take another photograph and uh, simply go on. When you reach the end uh, of the uh, winding, when you, after the 12th frame, it will just continue to wind and wind and wind and that will show a zero in the frame counter window. So when the zero is showing, that's when you load the film in the camera. So I just happen to have a, a roll of film here, which uh, Fuji Color Daylight type film, which is probably almost as old as this, this camera. Uh, it, it came in another camera I, I, I found, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and use it. It's a good film, I guess, to demonstrate how to load film in the camera. The first thing we need to do is take a look inside the camera. And when you have one of these, you need to have a take up spool on the top. Uh, normally when you buy a new twin lens reflex camera or medium format camera which uses 120 roll film, it should include a take-up spool. Uh, all the cameras I sell, I always make sure to include a take-up spool so you can start using the camera right away. If you don't have a take-up spool, you can usually find these for next to nothing or even free in old camera shops and things like that. And they're quite easy to put in. Uh, this is a, still has the original one in it, this uh, nice metal uh, film spool, most of the more modern ones are made out of plastic. And let's see, what does this one say on it? Uh, let's see, Sakura film. So uh, Sakura hasn't made film in a long time, so this is obviously quite an old uh, film uh, take-up spool. Uh, to put in the take-up spool, you have to line up the slot here with the slot on the winding knob and simply pull the lever like so and kind of pop it in and make sure that it catches. And then you need to load the film. So when you're loading the film on the camera, th there are two ways to load medium format film depending on the way that the kind of camera you're using. On a camera like this one, you want to load it so the colored paper is pointing or facing toward you on the outside. It is possible to load it the other way, where the back part, the black part, is showing toward you. That's not the way you load it in a twin lens reflex camera, but it is the way you would load it in uh, other cameras like Mamiya 645s or things like that. They they have uh, you push in the film back into the back of the camera, and to get it to work, you have to put in the film kind of backwards from a TLR. But on a TLR camera, you'll just load it the way I'm going to show you. Go ahead and I'll try to do show you if it does. If the door stays open. Okay, what you'll do is you'll insert the film uh, cartridge or roll and simply pull the paper up. And there's a slot in the take-up spool and you need to feed the paper into the slot and then simply start turning. And when I'm turning, when I'm putting the film in the slot, I always hold down a little bit firmly with my thumb to make sure that the slot is fully engaged with the paper and that it's actually pulling on the paper and that it's just, just not turning and the paper is not. And so we simply turn and turn and turn and you see these arrows here, these are alignment arrows. And on the Ricoh Daya camera, you have to turn them to about this point. And if you look where they are, maybe on either side here, you'll see a red mark on either side. Uh, when the arrows are pointed at the red mark, then you are ready to uh, close the film door and start operating the camera. <clears throat> now these arrows can be in different uh, positions depending on the different camera. Sometimes they are located a little higher, sometimes in the middle. And uh, it, it just depends on the kind of camera you're using. But in this case, they're here and at the moment they are properly lined up. So go ahead and close the film door like so. The next thing we have to do, and this is a very important point, we have to reset the film counter. 
so that the film is counting uh, is being counted properly by the winder. To do that, we have to push both of these levers simultaneously. This one here, there's a little arrow that says to kind of pull in this direction, and the one on the bottom, you pull forward as well. And when you do that, you'll notice in the window here that the zero moves a little bit upward. And when that happens, you simply start winding. It takes a few moments until it stops winding, and then the number one should be start showing right inside the little window. Now the camera is ready to use, and to operate the camera, what I would do is using a light meter or a light meter app in uh, a smartphone, I would, uh, you know, I would program the light meter or the app to, uh, to match the film which I'm using in the camera. This particular camera uses, is loaded right now with antique 100 speed film. And so uh, if I were shooting outside today in the sunlight with a 100 speed film and it's a sunny day, I would set the shutter speed to 1 one hundredth of a second and I would set the aperture to f16 and if i'm shooting at something which is in the sunlight uh, on a sunny day uh, using 100 speed film i would uh, shoot at 1 100th uh, shutter speed at f16 and this is what is known as sunny 16. if you're using 200 speed film you would choose the 1 200 shutter speed if you're using 400 speed film then you would use the 1 400th uh, shutter speed and if you are using 16 hard speed if you have a 16 hard uh, 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 speed shutter dial, which you know you won't find in a twin lens reflex camera. That's what what you would use. Now, if you want to uh, say uh, uh, to uh, operate the camera, it's a, a uh, faster shutter speed to catch capture more action. I would probably set this to more like f11, and then I would move the shutter speed up to one three hundredth of a second, and that should give me about what I need for shooting something which is running around in the daylight. And uh, yeah, it's you, slower shutter speeds for uh, uh, smaller apertures, uh, higher shutter speeds for more wide open apertures. And most of the film you're going to find for these cameras nowadays is going to be 200 or 400 speed and sometimes 800 speed. So that will give you a little bit more options with uh, the range of the shutter speeds you can use, but it's pretty basic. But anyway, uh, that's about all I have to say about the, the Ricoflex Dia M camera. And remember that uh, pretty much everything I've stated for this uh, Dia M, or Dia, I shouldn't say Dia Flex, uh, Diamond Ricoflex Dia M, uh, will work on the other versions. The only exception, the only difference to this camera to the other ones being uh, the film charging and uh, uh, I guess a shutter firing lever. Anyway, uh, that's it for uh, this video today, and I'll go ahead and post this shortly, and hopefully you'll be able to watch this uh, during the weekend. And for those of you who are still listening by now, maybe not many of you, I'll be posting uh, another video to my Two Wheels in Tokyo channel. If you'd like to see it, uh, just click on the link uh, in the description below this video. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again soon.